back to another week of STEM Power. This week, we are learning about the ocean. The fun fact of the week is that we've only explored about 5% of the world's oceans, when really, oceans cover about 70% of our planet. We will learn about the ocean in two ways, through the paper plate fish activity and through the capture the flag activity, ocean edition. The first activity we'll be doing is making fish out of paper plates. Before we start, let's learn a, bit, a little bit about fish and how they live. Fish are a vital part of the food chain in the ocean. They are a good source of protein for organisms in the sea, but also a good source of protein for us. For this reason, it is important that we are sustainable, which means we catch them in a safe way so that they can replenish their population and help sustain the population of the ocean. So, besides being a vital part of the food chain, fish are also very helpful for plants in the ocean. Much like chickens on land, if you've ever seen chickens, their food waste or their bodily waste or poop is a good fertilizer for plants because it provides a lot of nutrients and benefits to the soil around the plants. Much like chickens, fish do this for the sea floor. Their food waste that they excrete from their body is really beneficial to the plants below them and helps them grow and thrive. So, fish are a very important source of protein as well as a good fertilizer for the ocean plants. How are fish different from us? Besides the fact that we live in two different environments, um, fish are just built very differently. They have different features to adapt to their environment, as we've covered in evolution. Fish have fins, scales, and gills. As you might have guessed, fins help this, the fish swim because they have no legs. So they, help, they can swim through the ocean and they help navigate them and balance them. The second thing we've covered are gills. And gills help the fish breathe. They are located right about here if it was on a human. And what these gills do are they bring ocean water through the gills and then they exit out of the gills. And when this ocean water passes through, it has a lot of oxygen. So it passes through and in the gills, there's a really thin layer of skin and a lot of thin blood vessels. So when the water passes through, the oxygen is able to seep through this very thin skin into the blood vessels and carbon dioxide, which is um, what they exhale, can come out through and then be go into the ocean water and then be passed through. So they constantly filter this water back and forth, so that's why you might see the gills move like this. And then finally, they have scales. Much like we have skin, their scales serve as a protective coating. However, since they're in the ocean and they have many more predators as well as harsher conditions, their scales are very hard and um, kind of replaceable, kind of like our skin. So when a predator attacks it, like if a shark bites it, but it manages to get away, the scales serve as a barrier to the teeth. Um, obviously, they're not armor, but they are better than just being punctured completely. The scales also help them be protected when they rub against each other and just in general when they're tossed around in the sea. Let's start the activity. For this activity, you will need paper plates, scissors, markers, paintbrushes, paint, a white paper, and glue. You will also need four colors of construction paper. First, take your plate and shake up your paint. Here, I'm going to squirt the paint onto the plate and paint the inside of the plate red. Next, take your white paper and fold it so that you can cut out two white circles from it. After you unfold these circles, use a black marker to draw pupils in the center of both eyes. Next, take your four colors of construction paper. Cut out seven circles of each color. At this point, you should have 28 circles in total. Paint the outside of your plate the same color that you painted the inside of it. Here, I'm painting it red. It is important 
that you make a thin, even coat. That next, cut out two fins. I'm using brown, but you can use any color you want. And cut out a slice out of a part of your paper plate. Glue this slice onto the back to act as the tail and staple on the two fins on the top and bottom. You also want to glue on the eye wherever you would like. Next, glue on the scales. Fold each circle in half and only glue half of the circle onto the plate, like I'm doing. You can see here that I only glued down one hemisphere of each circle so that the other circle can flap up and look like a scale. Continue gluing until all of your 28 circles are done. After I've glued on the last gill, you can have your fish swim around. You can even draw gills if you would like. Here is another example of what your fish could look like. Why do fish have scales? The scales on a fish are analogous to the skin on humans. They are a protective coating. So when we run between two fence posts or, that are made of wood, we might get splinters, but we won't get very hurt. Similarly for fish, when they swim between coral, the scales help protect them from the coral, as well as get protected from predators when they are attacked. How do fish breathe underwater? As we've covered before, the fish have gills that have thin skin and many thin blood vessels. When the water passes through this, oxygen can be exchanged and CO2 can exit the cell, which is carried away, so that's how they can breathe. When you take a fish out of water, it's very difficult for it to breathe because these delicate structures, like the thin skin, collapse and they are kind of stuck together and they don't work as well on land. Just like we can't breathe in the water because we're not equipped to filter out oxygen out of water, fish are not equipped to breathe on land and the structures just don't work. About 50% of Earth's life is in the ocean. There are many species of fish and animals in the ocean, so how do they all relate to each other? Do they interact? Well, the relationships between one species and another in the ocean and on land is called a symbiotic relationship. Biotic implies that there are two, and so symbiotic means that it's between two species or organisms. We will be focusing on three types of symbiotic relationships, mutualism, commensalism, and paratism. The first relationship we'll cover is called a mutualistic relationship. In this relationship, both organisms involved win, or they benefit from each other. One example is between the remora fish and the manta ray. The remora fish ride on the back of the manta ray, and they eat things like algae and stuff that have accumulated on the manta ray, and in this way they can get nutrients, and it's a very easy source of food. And in return, the manta ray gets cleaned. This is an example of a mutualistic relationship. The second type of relationship is called commensalism. In this relationship, one organism benefits while the other is neither harmed or getting any benefits. An example of this is a barnacle and a whale. Barnacles frequently hitch rides on whales and they just stay there for the entirety of their lifetime. Since barnacles are very light compared to whales, these don't really hurt the whales and just benefit the barnacles. The third type of relationship is called parasitism. In this relationship, one organism benefits at the expense of the other. An example of this is a barnacle and a crab. The barnacles that we will be covering in this relationship are a different kind of barnacle from the ones that live on whales. These barnacles are not satisfied just living on rocks and whales or things that just kind of stay still. These barnacles need to find crabs. So this barnacle will go and find a crab. That is suitable. Once it finds its crab, it's going to inject its cells into the crab. Once these cells are in the crab, they're going to divide and reproduce. You can see here that there are a bunch of green veins in the crab, and those are the cells dividing, reproducing, and spreading through the crab, taking its nutrients. The crab is basically a walking zombie at this point. So, when the cells are ready, they will start creating an egg sac in the crab, as you can see here, where its normal egg sac would be. Obviously, this would be in place of the female crab's egg sac, but these can also be found in males, because when these barnacles start doing this, the crabs just become gender neutral, or they just have no gender. Then this egg sac 
is basically carried in the crab um, as long as it needs to until it hatches. So the crab is now a host for this parasite. You will need two to four sports cones, four of any kind of ball, and hula hoops. You only need one hula hoop for this activity. First, you need to set up the room. Here you can see the room is in gray, and I have a line of sports cones that divides the room into two. One side of the room should be smaller than the other side. With the other cones, you should make a rectangle in the larger side of the room. It should be able to fit four of the balls and four people. Here, the hula hoop is on the smaller side of the room. There should be five to seven people on the Sharks team, eight to ten people on the Nemo team, and two to three people on the sea anemone team. Blue will equal sharks, yellow will be fish, and purple will be anemone in this drawing. The sharks will start on the larger side of the room, and the fish and anemone will start on the smaller side of the room. The fish can go into the shark's territory, and the objective is to get one ball out of the rectangle and bring it safely to the hula hoop. You want to get all four balls into the hula hoop. The fish and an enemy can go into the shark's territory, but the sharks cannot go into their territory. However, the sharks can tag fish and an enemy. This rectangle is the safe zone for the fish. That means the sharks cannot tag them when they are standing in there. Your instructor could set a time limit there if she, they wanted to. If a fish is tagged, you have to kneel. The only way a fish can be saved is if the an enemy comes and tags the fish. Then, they can both safely walk back to their territory without being tagged. Only one ball is allowed out of the rectangle at a time. You cannot transport multiple balls at once. You can throw or run with the ball, but you cannot throw the ball over the line. You have to carry it over the red cones. The shark can intercept by tagging a fish or intercepting the ball. An enemy are not allowed to go into the safe zone, and are not allowed to touch the balls. They are only able to heal the fish. Sharks are allowed to tag fish and an enemy. The fish can be saved, but the anemone would die. What type of symbiotic relationship do sea anemone an and clownfish have? Sea anemone an and clownfish have a mutualistic relationship. In the game, the sea anemones an were the only way to revive the clownfish, and the clownfish helped the sea anemone an win the game. In real life, the clownfish can hide in the sea anemone and hide from predators like sharks. In return, the clownfish clean off the algae that accumulate on the anemone, helping the anemone and helping the clownfish. What are some examples of other symbiotic relationships in the ocean? As we've covered before, manta ray and remora fish have a mutualistic relationship, as well as barnacles and whales, they have a commensalistic relationship. Basically, these two groups of animals, they have relationships with each other because they interact with each other and they are benefiting off of each other. Either both are benefiting or just one is benefiting. Um, as we've covered also, the special species of barnacle and crab have a symbiotic relationship as well, but this is a parasitic relationship where one harms the other to get a benefit. I hope you had fun today. Today we learned about relationships between animals in the ocean, as well as how fish can breathe underwater and just how fish play a role in the ocean in general. I hope you had fun learning about the ocean this week. The ocean is an incredible place that we need to protect. When you go to the beach, make sure to use ocean safe sunscreen, which can normally be found identified by um, a sunscreen that uses zinc and titanium dioxide instead of chemicals um, that leave the sunscreen clear. These sunscreens are not safe for the ocean. Do you use any of these sunscreens? You might look a little paler than usual if you use this type of sunscreen, but it will be so much more beneficial to the ocean and you won't contribute to coral bleaching, which is a phenomenon where the coral get bleached and they just die because of the chemicals in our sunscreen. You can also help the ocean by reducing your use of plastic and making sure to throw away your plastic correctly when you do use it so that it don't, doesn't go into the ocean and harm our ocean animals. I hope you've learned a lot today and I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. I'll see you next week. Bye!
Thank you.